Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for your time today. Thanks again for joining us to one of these um, DMDV webinar series. Uh, today, we're very happy to welcome um, Dr. Patrick Michael Reed. He is the Joseph C. Ford Professor of Engineering at Cornell University. Prior, prior to joining uh, Cornell University, Dr. Reed um, was uh, a professor at uh, the, the University of Pennsylvania at Penn State. Uh, where um, his group and himself received uh, various awards, including the U.S. National Science Foundation Career Award in 2007, um, uh, as well as a broad range of, uh, of national and international honors, including the EPA STAR and NSF Fellowships, uh, paper awards, speaking awards, and dissertation honors for himself and his research group. Um, in 2012, he was honor um, with the American Society for Civil Engineering, Walter Hoover Civil Engineering Research Prize for his work in multi-objective systems analysis. Um, and Dr. Reed joined Cornell University in uh, 2013. He's uh, one of the most uh, well-known uh, researchers in the DMDU com community, and he and his group have managed to stay at the frontier of methods and research over the last decade. So Patrick, it's a big honor to have you here with us today. Um, today, uh, Dr. Reed will uh, talk about multi-objective optimization and robust infrastructure pathways. Um, and we are very happy for having you here in the seminar. Just before we start, uh, remember this is a weekly series. We've been running um, quite a, a good number of uh, seminars already. Next week, we will have Adrian bons Clip and uh, Dr. Jairo Quiroz and uh, Valentina Saavedra from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank. They will be talking about robust decarbonization strategies in Latin America. And um, you can see here in the roster, we have two more, uh, two more speakers after next week's presentation. Please visit, visit the website of the um, society. We are um, in uh, full gear for um, the planning and implementation of the, two, the, two, um, the annual meeting to 2020. So please visit, visit our website and um, you can learn more about uh, all the organizational issues uh, there. And uh, we are just finishing up the call for abstracts. Uh, probably we will be publishing uh, the call for abstract this, this week. And I really want to, um, if you're interested in the seminars and you're doing um, research that is um, appealing to uh, the DMDU community, please visit the website and make sure you submit your abstract uh, for this uh, year's annual meeting. And without further ado, um, Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Edmundo. And thanks everyone for taking the time um, to let me share my work with you all. So I wanna provide just a little bit of context. So uh, I'll be illustrating some of the concepts uh, throughout with uh, some work that we've been doing for more than a decade in uh, the research triangle area of North Carolina in the US, where you have four utilities that are all trying to individually and collectively manage their drought risks. A um, few things I wanna say here is the idea of, um, the front end of the seminar is gonna talk a bit about sort of demonstrating the choices that we make and thinking about that within the broader DMDU context. And then I'll end with some examples of infrastructure. So one of the most exciting things to me in terms of DMDU is actually not the academic side, but it's been the applied side. So this is an example of the Water Utility Climate Alliance or WUCA. Um, this is one of their earlier studies, but I would encourage you to go to their website and look at it. And what you see is that they, these are some of the largest water utilities um, in the United States and globally. And they're really thinking proactively and they're embracing the fact that actually accounting for this cone of uncertainty or thinking through many possible futures is actually instead of a, an impediment the decision, uh, it actually clarifies your pathway of decision. And hopefully you'll see some of that as I walk through this. I'm sure you all have seen some of this, but I think it's good just to, there's different terminologies, um, making under deep uncertainty, uh, bottom up decision frameworks. There's lots of different methods, decision scaling, infogap, et cetera. 
So it, there's a general overall philosophy, and I think it's well done uh, or well stated in Ben Bryant and Rob Limpert's paper, where you're shifting from asking the prediction question, how likely is this scenario? So the predict then act approach, to instead saying the decision impact, how likely would this scenario need to be to change my preference or to change my action? So. Uh, and it's a shift in focus and it's also it changes the the type of information that you need um, and shifts the entire decision framing so we'll talk through that in a bit more detail in terms of the context i'm going to go through um, and contextualize what the robustness frameworks have in common and then specifically talk about uh, my group and our work in incorporating um, thinking about multiple objectives in the process of dmdu um, and then illustrate why broadening out the range of objectives that you're considering is actually important. And then thinking through each of the steps that you take in, in the broader framework. And the other thing is thinking about how you would communicate this. Ultimately, at the end of the day, if this is gonna have any value, you're gonna have to potentially inform preferences and those preferences then inform action. Uh, preferences are fundamental to this and thinking about trade-offs across value systems and those and then I'll end out with thinking about how to bridge some of the work out of my group so our many objective robust decision making work with the dynamic adaptive policy pathways work and specifically I'll demonstrate some water infrastructure so what do all these approaches actually have in common so in all of these approaches, you have some set of alternative actions you're considering. It might be lines, uh, it might be operations, but you, you have some candidate set of actions or alternatives, and then you're gonna put those into many futures, so states of the world. Then you want to quantify robustness and this different ways that you can quantify robustness, but in essence, you want acceptability across many of these worlds for the alternatives that you're considering. And then once you have a sense of that, then the bottom up approach is saying, well, how much different does the future have to be before I actually would change my actions or I'm concerned? You can think of this um, it, within the context of a taxonomy that my former PhD, John Herman, now at UC Davis, uh, developed as part of his PhD. And without losing too much within this you can think of four steps and then those four steps one of the it's pretty simple what actions do you want to consider what world do you want to put those actions in what makes it acceptable in terms of performance and then what causes failure and ultimately those are four basic steps of almost every dmdu approach that you and one of the things that's different is if we go back and what actions when you have really complex systems um, and you're trying to go through many different worlds and you have chains of complicated interdependent um, actions you're contemplating, you may wanna search that space. And so one of the things that my group has specialized in is creating algorithmic approaches. So what you're seeing here is an optimal trade-off set that the algorithm doesn't know. And then in red is the algorithm seeking it and then what you get here is an optimal distribution or approximation of a three objective trade-off surface. Now this is a simple illustrative mathematical function where we know this, but in real systems, you ask what are the trade-offs? Typically it's very, very complex and you're gonna have to actually search through different Monte Carlo worlds for different candidate actions. And you're thinking about your state action and consequences. And so part of the story today is just how do you make that process using visual analytics, search and emerging tools, something to where you have a, a meaningful understanding and a, a true navigation of your preferences as well as the consequences of your preferences. So if we think about this, what are the consequences of the choices we make in these types of analyses? Often, um, this is actually a conversation that young Quackle and I actually have frequently within the DMDU community, where people get obsessed with, so this is my framework, when in fact you should be sort of 
obsessed with what are the appropriate ingredients for the problem that you're solving at hand. And then as an illustration of that, we'll go through this particular example. This is the first short-term version of the problem for the Carolina system with the four water utilities. Uh, so you can think of Chapel Hill, Durham, Cary, Raleigh. We have an overall region population of approximately 2 million people. Um, it's in the Southeast US. And if you're familiar with the Southeast US, they're supposed to have abundant water. They also have one of the fastest growing populations in uh, the entire United States. And all their reservoirs and their water supplies assume an abundance of water, which means that they have very low residence time uh, when there is a deficit. So when you have a high population and a low potential for storage, they actually can get themselves into significant drought risks. And they're trying to coordinate this. So in this particular part of the example, what they wanna figure out is how to do short term in the next decade. And as we were eliciting with them, all of the utilities agreed that they wanted to maximize the reliability of their supply. They wanted to try to minimize the restriction frequency. So when they stopped the customers where they're restricting their water use and they distinguished average costs from worst case costs because these are all debt driven systems. So they're nonprofit and they're used to annualized debt payments, but they are not good with volatility in their costs. And if you think about that, if you put your system in restriction, you're not selling water, you're losing money. And then if you start to coordinate, for example, buying transfer water from a neighbor, not only are you not selling your water, you're buying water. So it can create a financial instability. So you have this balance between financial stability and volumetric reliability. So for our model of this system, each of these actors has their own, you can think of dial. So when do they actually have a risk of failure where they'll trigger demand restrictions? Where will they have a risk of failure? And so this is where a, a risk of a supply short, where they'll actually activate water transfers. Also in, on the financial side, they can self-insure with a contingency fund. And then they could also transfer that risk to third-party insurance in terms of financial instruments. Now, one of the interesting things, you have four utilities and each of those utilities can move these instruments, but they affect themselves individually and they affect their neighbors regionally. And this is a situation where a multi-objective search tool can be helpful because mapping this sort of mix where you have each of these instruments for four different actors and each of those actors have their own individual objectives as well as a goal for a regional improvement. And as we think about this, and as we're searching for our understanding of our trade-offs, one of the things that at its core at DMDU is just making sure that you're really not in a tunnel vision mode of modeling, where you wanna go through and you wanna see as many possible futures and classify their potential relevance to your system. And part of that is the reality. So this is real data. OWASA, you can think of as shorthand for Chapel Hill. This is their actual data uh, was observed. And then each of these dates is the date of a projection. And in around 2003, there was actually a significant drought. They were both in financial and uh, as well as reliability um, vulnerabilities at that point, fundamentally changed the system, a threshold. This is an example of deep uncertainty, and this is something that we're fairly systematically bad at, is that projection of demand. Not to mention the fact that you're committing yourself in capital investments across this trajectory, where you're still gonna have to pay that, and you're balancing between having stranded assets that aren't being used to sh supply shortfall, while simultaneously trying to deal with your financial stability. So if we're thinking about these kinds of problems and we wanna put them in many states of the world, one of the things that we did is we started with their baseline. So if you're not a hydrologist, it's okay. This is just an annual sort of, this is what the historical flow duration look like. And so what you can see is that this side is droughts, this side is floods. Uh, and this line is the historical duration curve. This is what they were planning off region. And then one of the interesting things that we did is we just did a basic better accounting for the internal variability. No climate change, nothing like that. 
and we created 10,000 alternate flow duration curves or series in terms of the hydroclimate where you get this yellow. And then our RDM samples are shown in the blue. And we did this across demands, across the hydroclimates. And overall, this is two of 13 uncertainties that we explored in this particular system. One thing just to highlight, these black lines are baseline or status quo. These are the things that they were planning from um, before they were doing this analysis. Now, if we go back and we think about our four steps, one of the questions is, do we want to assume that, for example, only climate change matters and we're not going to account for human demand simultaneously or how they could potentially compound each other? And do we want to go and a priori uh, specify the scenarios or the worlds that we're going to look at? And do we want to specify the actions? So in the earlier slide, it's the dials of how they are actually implementing their portfolios. Alternatively, and this is what we've been doing, is you're using search here as an, another exploratory tool. You're moving through a space because you want high levels of reliability and high levels of financial stability, which are not trivial. And then we're putting those in many alternative worlds, and then we're not saying which factor is important first. And as if we think about that, how does that make sense? So one of the things in the system, when we elicited what they thought that their system was doing, they said that their baseline acceptable condition for their system that defines success is that ability greater than 99%, restriction frequencies less than 20%, and worst case costs less than five. So what you're seeing here is stream flow and evapotranspiration, which is a proxy for how Green dot means one of these worlds succeeded in meeting these conditions, their level of service. And a gray dot means that they failed. Now, this is the baseline world, the status quo is one. And this is below and this is above and below and above. And you can see here that there's not a very clear signal. And if we were contemplating this problem and assuming that only climate change was the vulnerability that we were considering um, and defining the system by. It's not a clear system. However, if we were to look at demand growth rate region, and you have stream flow on here, one of the interesting things is this is an actual threat. So this is the baseline or status quo. And what you can see is if that regional demand growth rate, even slightly above what assumed level is, immediately transitions. And so you have this huge threshold of behavior. And this is an example. So these are factor maps. And this is a way that where you can look into the system. Now, one of the things that we've already started to talk about, is what defines acceptability in these worlds? There's different ways that you can, one way is a satisficing. So you just count up the percent of worlds where you meet your performance. So the number of successes, which is similar to what I just showed you, over the total number of failures plus the number of successes, and then you get a, a percent of worlds where you're meeting your, your needs or your requirements. That's one of many possibilities. Others that are in the literature, um, it's common often to have regret-based measures, whether distance measures and uh, in this particular case, you could think about, well, if I have my best predicted baseline, how much do I deviate in an alternate world in one or more of my measures? You could have a different one where you say, well, how, what's the best that I did in each world? And then how much do I deviate from the overall best? What we just talked about is the domain criterion, so for worlds. And then there's another one, the information gap, if you're familiar with that approach, you can think about this as your sampling horizon. You move out a certain distance, you encounter uh, the highest level in your sampling strategies. One of the interesting things is in this problem, if we knew the trade-offs and we were gonna select what we prefer, they have a sense of the requirements, what would these different definitions of robustness actually say? One of the interesting things here, so what you see here is the actual
full trade-offs for this system, three optimal multi-objective potential combination of the way that in their portfolios, they're done. Grayed out are those solutions that are in the background that aren't considered. And what you have here are each of the solutions that these different definitions of robustness would see. And then up here is status quo. Now, all of these are interesting, and I'll give a little bit of a narrative of why these are interesting, but this is the most important one. This is what their status quo baseline system performance is. It's worse than in every single objective. Ideally, they would like to be here, but instead they're actually at a much higher worst case cost. Um, they have uh, reduced reliability significantly, extremely high restriction frequency. And part of this is because they were using baseline observed history in their analyses and in their models. They didn't even account for the, the variability. And if you think about that, if you're trying to count the number or the type of droughts you're gonna encounter and you only have 80 years of record, you clearly have not characterized the full suite of the types of droughts that you could potentially have within that period, much less the potential for changes in, in those droughts uh, with things like climate change and others, especially if you start to compound that with human factors. Now, one of the interesting things is when you look at each of these, only that satisficing where you're carefully considering multiple performance criteria and multiple performance requirements is meeting what they need. And that's illustrated here. So what you can see here is that the domain criterion uh, is counting the number of times that they're hitting each of these conditions. And this is also a subset of their overall objectives. Now, this is an interesting and important part of the entire illicit action and decision-making process. You could, you could change these. You could see how that changes the trade-offs. You could change your formulation. You could change each of these. It's an iterative learning process. And if we think about what we, I've already illustrated in terms of the factor maps, the last step is what's causing failures. And this is just illustrated reasonably nicely here in terms of obviously demand growth uh, is a big effect. And so when orienting you, so you have reliability, obviously you'd like to be near 100%, and this is the cumulative distributions. What we've done is we've mapped the distribution performance for all of the trade-off solutions for this system, and then we've highlighted a few. This is that status quo, a specified solution, so that you see this huge range in variability. This is the requirement for this particular objective that they wanna attain. And ideally what you would wanna do as you're managing the system is you want to move this to a vertical position. You have less variability and you're constantly maintaining high levels of reliability. And if we look at this, you can see the large portions of the Pareto approximate set that we discovered are not actually doing well across many different worlds. And when we increase, uh, and include uncertainties in the search, it actually helped. But what really helps is if they mitigate the demand growth rate. And even as low as a 20% coordinated reduction in regional demand growth fundamentally transitions the way that they can meet reliability. And this same behavior can be seen in each of the other component objectives that define the requirement for robustness. So you have a requirement here and a requirement here. And what they give up for that is that they have to accept a, a moderate increase in average year costs. Now, in this case, they're better at actually average year debt payment than they are worst case. But in each sense, what we've done here is we've identified the one factor that dominates what's causing failure. And we've highlighted a mix where you have all of these alternatives which represent different preferences and how when you mix what is controlling failure across these alternatives, you can contrast it to with the status quo, what they're currently doing, and you can show how it's transforming their ability to meet what they want. Another interesting thing here is that often in situations where they have complex systems, they may not, they thought they were meeting these levels of service with their existing portfolio, uh, which they were not. 
And you can do this with a, a variety of tools. You can use global sensitivity tools. You can use things like patient rule induction method. And you can see that for this, this tells us the range from our baseline to above. It's the similar to the prior mapping that I gave you. Uh, and you can see the same trend in other tools that emerge. For example, you see here again, demand growth rate is the most sensitive. There's a lot of tools where you're using this mix of either machine learning or sensitivity tools, and you're getting a sense of what's controlling failure uh, and how it changes preference. So with that relatively um, broader background, uh, illustrate this idea. So what I just showed you was an illustration of our many objective robust decisions. I think one of the coolest ideas that's emerged in um, last years is the dynamic adaptive policy pathways. We've been diving into this a bit. So to acknowledge here, uh, what I'm about to show you is a recent PhD dissertation of Bernardo Chindade and collaboratively with Dave Gold in my group and Greg Troklist on at UNC financial risk instruments. So in this particular case, when we move into this particular um, new version of the problem, the last version, they were just trying to coordinate with each other and they weren't changing what they're investing. Now what we've added is each of these yellow dots is a new potential infrastructure project. They either individually or in some instance, collectively could invest in. So one of the questions that they have here is how do they actually combine their short-term instruments um, and their long-term investments in a way um, that individually and collectively benefits the region? And you can see that the demands are highly asymmetric in terms of Raleigh being much higher uh, and down to Owasso, which is basically Chapel Hill. Cooperation mechanisms here, uh, treated transfers to Jordan Lake. So once the water goes into a treated pipe, you can have buy water from a neighbor. Another is that they're exploring the potential for joint infrastructure investment in a either high capacity or a lower capacity water treatment process on the Jordan Lake. One of the ways that this has advantages is you're contractually bridging the and so they have joint ownership. And what's unique in this work is that actually we accounted for more than 40 sources of uncertainty that are typically not accounted for, combining climate, uh, hydrology, demand, construction delays, uh, whether or not your policies are actually behaviorally effective. So if you restrict a population, doesn't mean that the population responds. Thinking about uncertainties in your bond market and your finance. One of the biggest issues in this is that we actually, there was no model that actually existed where you could actually model these uncertainties. So we had to model the individual systems and then the collective systems. And we spent approximately four years developing a model that would meet their fidelity requirements and encompass the, the range of uncertainties that they uh, wanted to consider. In doing so, we could then consider those both in terms of the search phase as well as the evaluation phase of how should planning management decisions be formulated under deep uncertainty. So what's interesting here is you'll often hear in many different fields, actually or different sectors, division between planning and management. Planning being typically decadal and infrastructure and discrete, and then management being operations, maybe daily, weekly, something that is more continuous. And it's been very difficult to combine both of those in a uniform approach. Uh, and that's one of the things that we've been focused on. And then another aspect of that is that what you do should be state aware. You probably wouldn't drive down the road with a blindfold taking exactly the same actions with your accelerator and your steering wheel, no matter what world and what road you are on. Our models probably shouldn't do that either. So we should move towards closed loop feedbacks where you have state and I'll illustrate how we are doing that here. So this is similar to what I had just shown you. We have those dials. We're just showing the dials as a slightly different illustration here. And so your restriction trigger. So we have a trigger where we have a risk of failure where we'll do restrictions, transfer triggers. 
you have to decide how much you actually want in your reserve fund as part of your annual revenue. And you can also trigger uh, insurance contract. And this is weekly, so you have this short term. We can do the same sort of structure and think about longer term too. And then when you add infrastructure to this, one of the things is there's many different candidate projects, individual or collective groups to consider. So you have to rank order them and then you have to figure out when you're going to actually trigger that infrastructure. So again, you have a prioritization and a sequencing. So here's how you can put both of these, the short and the long term in together. And so risk of failure here is any time that they get to a level of storage in their surface reservoir systems of 20%, they consider that a failure, 20% or below. And then there is sufficient dynamic data where you can get a sense in any given period, whether it's a week or longer, uh, what the risk of failure is. And so if we start here, we can have our status quo infrastructure. So we start with our infrastructure and this is gonna be our pathway. And so what we can have is we have one dynamic for long-term risk of failure where we're gonna sequence our infrastructure. And then in this particular case, this is the infrastructure development trick. When you cross this red line, you're gonna develop a project or you wanna initiate that project. Likewise, here you have the total utility water storage. And then this is the short-term risk of failure. And this is where you do things like your restriction triggers or your transfer. And then this is the actual trigger value here. Now, if we think about this, rising demands drive increases. So that's what happens. It's a race between capacity and demand. And in this race, once that rises and crosses your long-term risk, you trigger this uncertain window. And one of the things we do account for here is uncertainty in the construction period and availability of that capacity. But now you wanna trigger that infrastructure and when you trigger that, one of the things that's is tough, interesting, is this is a state aware action. You now have increased the capacity of the system. It resets the overall state. So this is a highly nonlinear threshold uh, in terms of being able to capture this. It gives you a continuous and consistent short term and the long term. Um, because you can do smart things each week to lay your potential for investment uh, for a longer term. And you can think about this process happening over many potential cases. So what I just showed you is one possible infrastructure pathway for one instance or draw of the uncertainty. Now we could do this for many different potential worlds, and then you could end up with a, so in this case, you can think of a thousand worlds and this is a thousand stacked infrastructure pathways. And this is the sequence in time when you would trigger some particular infrastructure. You can see in this case that when you are looking at some of your cases, you actually you do not have to invest as early or later. And if we change the knobs to a different policy, so this is one way that we could set all of our decisions. Second way we could set our decisions, maybe we delay our investments. So this is far less risk averse. You can see here that you're investing here in about 2025 across worlds. Here, 2035 is a bit the earliest and you delay all the way out in some of your, your realizations here. The other interesting thing is in each world, your closed loop rule system is doing what's appropriate to that world. Now, one of the challenges is how do we set these dials and how do we set priorities? And that's again where the multi objective search tool. It is optimization, but it's optimization used as an exploratory search tool. So, how do we do this? How do we set these decision thresholds and what's the, what's the consequence of the way that we've done that? So, for this particular real system, we spent a long time. This is the most important thing building sort of credibility and relevance with the simulation, being able to encompass both that, the act and mapping to the objectives. And then we optimized across a sampling of a thousand deeply uncertain worlds um, to look at the search under uncertainty. Now, one of the things is you can think of this as 
these are, we're searching and training in a sense, it's similar to reinforcement learning. We're training these rules using a thousand worlds. But if you're gonna do that, even though a thousand is a fairly large sample, and this is a non-trivial computational challenge, you realize that the likelihood that this system is going to have exactly the conditions in this thousand member ensemble is basically zero. So what we then do is that we broaden the envelope of evaluation, and this is where the deep uncertainty reevaluation comes in. And this is where we start quantifying robustness and we're using the satisficing approach. This is what we talked about earlier, the global domain criterion. And they're maintaining consistency, a slight change in the requirements here with the capital investment, but it's very similar. A mix of reliability, restriction, frequency, and worst case costs. As we move through this particular example, now we reevaluate each of our trade-off solutions that we basically trained, or those rule systems that were optimal trade-offs, and we've reevaluated them across two million worlds. And then we count. So if a solution, which is shown as a line here, was perfectly uh, robust for all of our actors, Owasa, Durham, Raleigh, or Kerry, it would be a line across the top of this plot. When you see diagonals, that means that when one utility is doing well, another utility is doing quite poorly. And you can see that here. So one of the interesting things is now we've changed from looking at solely just performance trade-offs in our level of service to now looking at interactor trade-offs and robustness. And that raises a variety of interesting questions. And in an example here, you can see Raleigh's performance conflicts with the other utilities very significantly. So oh, does any solution represent an acceptable regional compromise? There's a lot of ways that you could explore this. So when we do this with the utility, we actually show a mix of the performance trade-off space, and now we're in the robustness uh, trade-off space between the actors. So there's different games that we could play. What if we wanted to be a uh, benevolent social planner? So in this case, the benevolent social planner seeks to minimize in a least square sense uh, dissatisfaction of it. tries to be um, the best for each of these particular uh, individuals in terms of their robot. And so if you're a social planner, this would be uh, as close to the ideal solution. This is the solution that you would choose. This would minimize the inter-utility conflicts to some degree. So now you're, you're changing, right? Robustness here isn't and this is, I'd say, one of the biggest fallacies I see in a lot of analyses is in most systems, they have neighboring systems and those neighboring systems are not actually independent. And so when we see this particular case, this, the minimum least squares is this solution. This is what a benevolent uh, social planner would choose to, to minimize conflict across the actors. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's what's most likely. And so there's another way that we could play this particular hypothetical decision. Think about it through another game theoretic concept, thinking about regional stability, thinking about a willingness to cooperate or the practicality of it. So if we, we move and we start thinking about this in a slightly different way, we can think about the power index. So there's a lot of reasons or rationales to why you could think about uh, using the power index. The short of it is that you're sort of minimizing the coefficient of variation or the variation of dissatisfaction across the individuals. But an important aspect of this is you, how do you weight the power of individuals? So Raleigh is the capital of North Carolina, has the largest population, it has the potential largest exposure of individuals that have high levels of poverty. So there are multiple reasons why you may weight um, deficits in water for them much higher than the others. And there's also they have, it's the capital of the state, there's a lot of political power. Now, if we weight Raleigh higher, then Raleigh would choose a different solution. And now we have this interesting um, exploration of the consequences of preference and interactor conflict. So you have a benevolent social planner trying to minimize interactor robustness conflict, and then you have the power index.
is weighted towards the most political and potentially exposed individual. And so one of the questions is, which deep uncertainties control system performance and how does that change across these two candidate different pathways? And don't forget that we're doing both short-term and long-term dynamic and adaptive policy planning here. So we can play with this a bit. And so one of the most interesting things I'd say in what's emerging in DMDU and some of the great work that's coming from Edmundo's group and from Rand and others, uh, and Young Quackles, uh, is this idea of really getting into the uncertainty space, more complex pathways. Thinking about what are the trade-offs, the robustness trade-offs look like in that uncertainty space. Do the trade-offs and vulnerability change with the perception of how you would make this compromise? They may choose something very different. One of the things that's uh, important is that actually having a diversity of alternatives. Then we've just illustrated two cases of preference. Now, what we've done here is you have the top row, which is the social, and the bottom row is the power index solution. We again are showing factor maps. You have red dots, which are failures to meet the requirements, which we've given before. And gray is success. And what we have on the X axis for each of these factor maps is the single most important factor that drives success or failure. And on the Y axis is uh, the second most important for each individuals. And so one of the things that you'll see across both the social planner and the power index is consistent with our earlier work, is that the demand growth rate within the region is the singular most important thing, regardless of all other factors being. Now, when you're thinking about this, when you have a situation where you have this highly vertical, what this is basically saying is this is the only thing that's really dominating carry. And you have this extremely unlikely very high demand growth rate um, and therefore for the social planner solution where there's a high level of interactive compromise carry is doing quite well they're independent you get a bit of an interaction with permitting time so whether or not new infrastructure comes on and then raleigh has a substantial and complex failure surface there's a whole deep dive into the mathematics. So we use boosted trees classification here to get at this. And one of the interesting things here is when you have infrastructure, discrete infrastructure sequences, and um, you have the continuous shorter term instruments, you can get these very um, complex fingering of failures. Um, but going beyond that, what you see here is a bigger point. There's two different solutions here. If Raleigh does not follow through with the benevolent social planner approach, they, in the power index approach, actually transfer their failure um, vulnerability dominantly over to Durham and Cary. Not only that, they actually sensitize Cary to evaporation rate or climate change. So both, you can think of this now where the climate drivers uh, are really important. And then they also change here um, what uh, Durham is sensitive to. So the action or the way that you navigate the suite of policies or the investment actions and the way that an individual exerts their power within the decision or the negotiation can fundamentally shift uh, the infrastructure investment intensity and what the other individuals are fundamentally uh, vulnerable to. So with that, the robustness conflict shift vulnerability between the regional actors. Uh, a few comments here. We started this particular exercise, there was no model capable of analyzing the mix of financial flows and their coupling to short-term and or long-term uh, investments. And there was no overall regional model that could account for the, the broad range of uncertainties. So uh, one of the core and biggest and most important investments here is the development of a flexible modeling framework as a boundary element um, that increases the credibility, the relevance, and the, so the legitimacy of the conversation you're having with individuals to create the potential for these types of discoveries. 
So just a few endpoint reflections. Uh, this last example, these are cooperative dynamic rule systems. So this is much closer to uh, a closed loop decision approach. Linking crisis in the short term and long term risk management planning. Um, okay. This shows exploratory modeling with the visual analytics where you can help navigate regional robustness conflicts. You have a variety of spaces here that are interesting in terms of the performance trade off space between reliability, restriction, frequency, capital investment, and then you have the robustness space. And in this particular case, you have interactor. Um, utility uh, and then thinking through this process of how you navigate the performance conflicts and the robustness conflicts fundamentally shape what you discover uh, are the drivers of vulnerability within individual systems and systems uh, and although this is a water example what this is an example of is the the regionalization problem where you have a limited resource and multiple uh, trying to coordinate individually and collectively. And I would say that's probably gonna be something that's seen in a lot of different um, sectors. So with that, thank you for your time and your attention. I've given a few of the citations for the underlying work here and some of the things that supported it. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Thank you very much, Patrick. And this has been a wonderful presentation. Let's um, uh, hear from uh, some questions. Let me just uh, begin by uh, reading a few I have on the Google form. Um, so this uh, question from Chris Forrest. What are some examples where deep uncertainty is accounted uh, for in the modeling? Uh, for example, when something is not quantified or characterized and, and would not be sampled. Are there, are there examples from your projects when this situation uh, happens? So you're saying, in essence, important factors that you don't have um, direct quantitative um, ability to model, if I understand correctly. I believe so. That's, that's, that's correct. Uh, and Chris, if you can uh, clarify, that would be great. Yes, that was what I was thinking about. Yes. When the model is just not capable of de handling it or it was a surprise um, that wasn't accounted for prior to running all of the systems. Yeah, I mean, in this case, the model has evolved over several years um, from individuals to collective to encompass a much, much broader range. Um, but I think one of the things that in a situation, and another sort of way to state that is you should always be cognizant that the failures of concern may not live in the model you're using. Um, is to, I think, always, first of all, be very careful in the way that you evaluate and contemplate the model itself and sort of its structural representation and ability to capture things. And to the best of your ability, get a sense of what you can, what you feel that confidently that you can at least model. And then this becomes, to me, uh, an elicitation side. So in addition to the exploratory modeling with models is to make sure that you're engaging with the, the stakeholders and that you're eliciting. And in this sense, you probably, probably need to use a mix of narrative scenario or other components uh, to augment what your, your model can do, would be my suggestion. And there's some examples in Marheline Hasnut's work and uh, in several studies at RAND where they've done a mix of modeling and other types of scenarios, and I'm sure Edmundo can give more resources there. Thank you very much, Patrick. Let's, uh, I have a few more questions in the Google form, but uh, before going there, um, I don't know if, if anyone wants to ask a question in the room. If you want to do so, you can just unmute yourself uh, or raise your hand virtually and we'll get to you. Okay, let me just um, then read another question from the Google form. Um, Is, is, there a, is there a way of quantifying um, the combination of conditions that trigger different uh, infrastructure investments uh, in your example of adaptation? And when it refers to the different criteria for decision making, um, is there a way of making a synthesis out of that um, comparison and synthesize it into an adaptive plan? Uh, 
Yeah, so um, I'll answer that in two parts. I would say when we are doing this, so the example here, each point here is a world where you're simulating uh, this policy. Um, and this policy is highly adaptive. And what we are doing with these factor maps or the scenario discovery process here is we're showing which of our variables are driving um, not meeting our robustness condition. Just like we're doing this, you could also go back to the risk of failure triggers and you could do a sensitivity analysis to see which of these factors are driving that capacity to demand risk of failure dynamic. So it would be very similar to this. It's just a change from the robustness metric that we're using here to the actual, the decision metric that we're using. And then I think in terms of synthesizing this down into an actionable plan, um, there are examples of this in the Water Utilities Climate Alliance. And then here, one of the things that boils down to um, for these utilities is that they were already using risk tables in a lot of their decision making. And the policies that we're using basically abstracts the logic of those risk tables. And so it's a fairly natural fit in terms of how they do that. But what they, they had was they had one, one risk table that they had specified. Whereas here we're giving them a variety of different candidate alternatives and then putting those in a variety of worlds. So they, they could potentially have a, a broader context of how they would plan and adapt. I think the one thing that's very interesting from a broader planning perspective um, is the sequencing. One of the things is, for example, we've been in a lot of conversations, not just with the system, but other systems where they want to delay capital investment. Um, and so maybe doing short-term actions and some other mitigative measures, instead of having to invest what you can see in every single world in 2025 across these three instruments, you might be able to delay with this policy. And then the question is, what is this policy doing that's different? That's in your plan, really talking through the specifics of what your, your portfolio management tools are, your financial tools, and what your priorities are. And in this particular instance, um, we're looking at these types of graphs and looking at how consistent major investments or shared investments. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, let me let me get you another question here in the Google form. This is from Josue Morales from Tecnología Monterrey. Um, he uh, his question is um, related to the you know the um, the time frames for developing this this sort of you know like integrative approaches. And he as is asking about um, have you thought about implementing the methodology methodology interacting with um, data that is produced in real time. For example, uh, from you know um, uh, trading uh, data repositories or other you know um, data streams that are updated on an ongoing basis. I think in the longer term, um, right now, I would still classify this as um, a screening analysis in terms of how to design their short-term and long-term combinations of actions. But you could see if you expanded this to start thinking about uh, pressure distribution systems, um, some specifics on the hydraulics of the pipes and the connectivity, um, having or having some sense of uh, the inflows to the system, especially if it's a more complicated system than this, you could start to think about where that risk of failure dynamic uh, trigger is actually enhanced or even in a Bayesian sense conditioned over time with uh, emerging um, data. Not, and it, it's a question of how valuable that data would be and how sophisticated. I would say uh, large groups that are really focused on the regionalization problem, um, and in Suez comes to mind, when they come in and they help take over in a public-private partnership, um, that's only financially viable for them if they find uh, economies of scale and efficiencies within the system. And I think uh, a lot of the monitoring and the real time stuff is actually in metering and then the human behavioral side. I think that's um, a, a huge potential.
Uh, and I think there's a lot of work there. But yeah, I think longer term, you can think of this as a conditioning of adaptive rule systems in the Bayesian context with uh, is something, if appropriate, real time uh, data streams. Yeah. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, with that, uh, let me see if we have more questions in the room. Uh, does anyone wants to um, ask a question uh, to Patrick before we, we leave um, the seminar? I believe that's pretty much all the questions we have today, Patrick. Um, well, um, thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much for your availability today. This has been a wonderful seminar. We will be posting the recording of this seminar in the DMDU website. Please um, be aware that uh, next week we will have um, Adrian Bonstreet from the uh, Inter-American Development Bank presenting on the carbonization. And don't forget to visit um, the DMDU website for um, the call for abstracts for the annual meeting, which will be published later, th later this week. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick. Um, that's uh, pretty much uh, everything for today. Uh, best regards to everyone that was able to join. Thank you all for your time. Have a great night. Uh -huh.